Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Eunice Hernandez. I am a criminal justice policy associate, I mean, policy coordinator with uh, the Drug Policy Alliance, a, a local and national organization working to end the war on drugs. Uh, I work out of our LA office and I focus on local and state uh, criminal justice legislation and policies, as well as the implementation of Prop 47 and Prop 64. I've been working. Uh, organizing free legal clinics since Prop 47 passed. I've helped pass some legislation. Last year we passed civil asset forfeiture. This year we're working on repealing uh, certain drug sentencing enhancements, which I'm super excited about, the RISE Act, SB 180. Uh, so if you haven't submitted a letter of support, please do so. Uh, today I'll be talking about Prop 64 and the criminal justice pro uh, provisions within the initiative. Uh, so Prop 64, um, before I get started, let me uh, just talk about the context of marijuana real quick. I get really excited and just want to jump in. Uh, but marijuana just, just became legal in November of 2016, last year. Before that, uh, between uh, 26, 2006 and 2015, there was about half a million marijuana arrests. And that was even with medical marijuana being legal for, I mean, uh, being legal for almost 20 years. So Prop, 40, uh, Prop 64 made it possible for adults 21 and over to possess, transport, uh, share, um, and buy or possess up to an ounce of flour of marijuana and up to uh, eight grams of concentrate, as well as grow up to six plants at home. Uh, but Prop 64 is more than just legal marijuana. It has a lot. It's 62 pages worth of initiative um, so again, it legalized uh, uh, marijuana for adults 21 and over, it fully legalized hemp. Uh, it establishes a commercial regulatory system. So yes, medical marijuana uh, became legal in 1996 with Prop 215, but that was only medical. And no infrastructure was created for that until 2015 with the MRSA. Uh, the governor signed a set of bills that created a regulatory framework for that. Uh, but still, uh, recreational had no framework. Under 64, uh, the framework is built into MRSA. So uh, there are some changes and some differences between MRSA and Prop 64, but the regulatory system will look almost the same. Uh, taxation and revenue. Under uh, Prop 64, we uh, explicitly said where we wanted the funding to go. Under the initiative, every year, communities most devastated by the war on drugs will receive up to $50 million. 50% uh, of that funding has to go to community-based organizations, and that can go for a, very, a variety of services, including legal services, housing, substance use, and so on. Um, but my favorite part is the broad decriminalization and sentencing reform within the initiative, which I will focus on today. And this just goes over what is legal for adults now, under 20, uh, above 21 and over. So under Prop 64, most marijuana offenses are either reduced from felonies down to misdemeanors to infractions or completely legalized. And this is reflected on a kind of like a three-tier scale. So for 17 and under, so youth 17 and under, they can no longer be incarcerated for a marijuana offense. Uh, they will be given non-fined infractions uh, with the results having to be community service, uh, behavioral services, substance use services, and a variety of other things, but not incarceration. And that's for 17 and under. 18 to 20, which is kind of that we couldn't fully, you know, um, legalize marijuana for them either. Uh, they get fined infractions and certain misdemeanors. Uh, and adults 21 and over, almost all offenses for them are completely legal. Uh, but now instead of marijuana sales being a felony, it's a misdemeanor. Um, and I'll talk about some of the retroactivity pieces. Um, Prop 64 impacts three groups of people. It impacts those incarcerated for marijuana offenses, it impacts those on, uh, currently on supervision for a marijuana offense, and it uh, affects people that are no longer involved with the criminal justice system for these particular offenses. Um, and who's familiar with Prop 47? If you could raise your hand real quick. Great. So the retroactive piece in Prop 64 mirrors that of Prop 47, meaning the process is almost entirely the same, um, and I'll go through it, but the forms are free, the submission is, submission is free, and also the retroactive piece is the same, except for one minor difference, is that under Prop 64, there is no sunset date, meaning that people who have these offenses from years ago can apply now up to indefinitely to have these offenses either reduced, removed, or dismissed off their record. Under Prop, six, under Prop 47, we had a three-year sunset date. Now it's uh, an additional five-year sunset date, which is great, and hopefully in the next few years we can take that sunset 
Valentine's Day date off as well. Because even just with my uh, Prop, 6, Prop 47, um, there was about a million people in the state who can apply for these, uh, to have these offenses retroactively reduced. Um, and just knowing that within the last 10 years, there's about been about 500,000 just marijuana arrests, we know that there's a significant number of folks not involved with the criminal justice system that can apply to have these offenses reclassified. Um, so how can people with marijuana convictions clear their records? Uh, so people that are no longer involved in the criminal justice system for this particular marijuana offense or offenses that they want uh, changed on the record, they will apply for what's called a reclassification. Just like under Prop 64, um, I mean under Prop, sorry, I do a lot of Prop 47 work, so I'm, I'm, I'm gonna confuse them a little bit, I'm sorry. Um, but just like under Prop 47, there's pretty much like a few steps that people can follow. It's very simple. One, obtain, uh, uh, determine your eligibility. So under Prop 47, a person has to prove that they're eligible, right? And they, ha and there's, they can't have certain offenses in order to be eligible. Well, under Prop 64, there is no, um, how do I say this? There's no barriers to that. Even if you have to register as a sex offender, you can still apply uh, to have these marijuana offenses reduced and removed. Even if you have certain violent offenses, you can have uh, these marijuana offenses reduced and removed or re cleared off your record. So a person uh, determines their eligibility by getting their criminal record or a live scan. Um, in LA, I, I work in LA County in Southern California. We do a lot of live scan events where we, uh, we pay for the live scan. People come in and they get the live scan mailed to them. And a live scan, I'm not sure if everybody knows, but it, uh, you get your fingerprint scan sent to the DOJ and they'll mail you a copy of your arrest record and your uh, conviction record. Uh, one of the things that attorneys have told us is that live scans are great for a long comprehensive list, but that the court dockets are better because it has more detail. Uh, so you can go to the courthouse where you convicted, uh, where you were convicted, and get a copy of your criminal docket. Uh, in LA County, I can tell you that most of the courthouses won't charge. Uh, sometimes they'll charge you 10 cents per page, and it, that varies, I think, by county and by court. Um, so once you have a copy of your criminal record, you obtain your Prop 64 forms. Um, and I have left a bunch on the table, some copies. So every county can decide what form they want to use. They can say, you know what, I want to create my own form or I'm going to go with the forms provided by the Judicial Council of California. LA County and um, we, we we're currently working on a website where we're obtaining all these forms and putting them on there so people can grab them. Uh, and we know that most people are going, most counties are using the form provided by the Judicial Council of California. So they're not really rec recreating the, their forms. Uh, but what a person does is that they'll, for every case they have, they have to submit a packet to the courthouse that they were convicted. And I will get into the details of that a little bit later. Um, so you grab your forms, you complete your forms, uh, you make your packets. An individual will make three packets. One for uh, the person's records. Another copy of their packet is submitted to the court clerk at the courthouse they were convicted. And another copy is uh, sent to the uh, district attorney's office at that courthouse where they were convicted. Um, yes? The, the person has to have someone else file that proof of service. So uh, Cindy could file it for myself, but I couldn't, I couldn't serve the, the court. She would have to serve them, <coughs> or the DA, I mean. Um, so these packets, just like under Prop 60, uh, 47, they have to be submitted at the courthouse where you were convicted. Um, there is no hearing required under Prop 64, so the judge will just hear it. Um, in, in LA County on our website, and I'm sure it's like this for other, other counties, you can look up when the judge will hear your case. So although no hearing is required, if you can make it to the courthouse on the date that your case is scheduled to be heard, uh, you can go and the judge will tell you right there and then your case has been reclassified or it's been granted or you know what, it's not been granted, which is great. But again, there is no hearing required. Uh, and every courthouse is different. Um, some courthouses, we haven't seen um, that they take a long time with 64. Luckily, they have a mechanism that's already been created under Prop 47. So we're not seeing a lot of wait times. We're seeing a lot of uh, quick turnarounds uh, for the submissions, which is great. Um, on our website, so we created a website, it's myprop64.org, and it mirrors the My Prop 47 website, where um, on our Prop, My Prop 64 website, we have, uh, we're gonna upload all the forms each county is using. Uh, you can find all the information for all the courthouses in your county. You can find the information for all the public defenders in your county, all the district attorneys, uh, as well as the court websites. Um, 
And this is just an infographic that we made uh, so that people can figure out how to reclassify their offenses. Um, so the offenses that qualify are possession of marijuana, uh, growing or cultivating marijuana, uh, possession with the intent to sell marijuana, uh, and sales of marijuana, as well as transportation of marijuana. Um, so if anybody had these offenses, they can apply. And again, there's no barriers to it. So even if you have certain offenses on your record, you can still apply uh, to have these offenses reduced, removed, or dismissed off your record. Um, again, uh, just a quick uh, overview of the process. Step, step two, get a copy of your criminal record. Uh, step three, complete your reclassification forms. And again, each county is using their own forms. Um, step four, create your reclassification packets. And again, it's three copies, one for yourself, one for the district attorney, and then one for the court clerk's office. And it's free, so you don't have to pay a fee for, for filing this, not like an expungement. Um, and step five, file these reclassification packets at the courthouse where you were convicted um, and just wait for approval. Every courthouse is different. It can take uh, several weeks. It could take a couple months, um, but yeah, there is no set date on that. Is approval sort of just granted or, or are they looking at specific criteria? Well, it, it's up to, under the statute, it's up to the prosecutor to prove that you're ineligible uh, for the reclassification or resentencing. So that burden doesn't fall on the person petitioning okay. or applying. Unlike on Prop 47, it does. So the person has to prove that they're eligible. But under 64, a person doesn't. Um, so how can people incarcerated apply to be released? Okay, so I, I, I talked about reclassification being for those folks that are no longer involved with the criminal justice system for these particular offenses. For people that are still involved with the criminal justice system for these offenses, uh, whether they're incarcerated or under supervision, uh, they would apply to have these offenses uh, resentenced. Uh, so the individual would be resentenced. Now this process is different than a reclassification, uh, and we do suggest folks to work with either the attorney that they worked on for, the, that, for that particular case, or that they reach out to their local public defender's office uh, for support on this. Um, just because, you know, We've seen people who are on, like, let's say, formal probation. They apply to get their offense uh, resentenced. And instead of getting completely off probation, a person goes on to, like, summary probation. And so that might be good for some individuals, but that might not work for others. And we, we hope that a person can work with an attorney so that they can get the best outcome for their case in regards to resentencing. Uh, we know that because of AB 109, most of the people who have these offenses are not in our prisons. Most of them are in our LA County jails. I mean, sorry, LA County. They're, most of them are in our county jails. Uh, so I know uh, in LA County, we have about 78 who are just marijuana standalone offenses. But there's a, over 100 that have marijuana plus offenses. So marijuana and an additional offense. And uh, the public defenders are working with them to get them out, just like they worked uh, to get people out uh, who had Prop 47 offenses. So I'm asking this question because I've done a lot of recent uh -huh. hearings, mostly for compassionate release. Mm -hmm. um, and like, I'm wondering, do the, okay, so if you had a conflict attorney mm -hmm. to, in your original case, um, would that attorney or another conflict attorney be paid to actually take on your resentencing? Or are you allowed to go back to the public defender? Well, I think that depends on the county because in LA County, if you have a conflict, you will automatically get transferred to the alternate public defenders. Right, right. But some counties aren't big and don't have, you know, an alternate public right. defender's office. The reason I'm asking is that with doing resentencing mm -hmm. for compassionate release, which is a resentencing way it gets mm -hmm. down to thing, um, I don't know, in 20 years of doing compassionate release, I've never heard of a conflict attorney actually being paid for doing those hearings. And it, it was a really serious problem to get the um, conflict attorneys to agree to do the appearances. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, and this was across lots yeah. of counties throughout yeah. the state. Um, and so I just wondered if, if that had, has arisen yet as an issue or if that seems like folks are just okay copacetic with it because this is a bigger process. But under Prop 47, I haven't heard anything of okay. that sort. Okay. Um, and right now we're really into the early stages of Prop, 40, Prop 64 where we haven't heard like legislation yeah. or, or um, barriers or conflicts come up, but I'm sure that if it does, it will come up. And it's something, we have an office here in Oakland, it's our Office of Legal Affairs, uh, where it's just attorneys that are working on, well actually one of our attorneys here, Joy, Joy Havlin, she's in the back, and she's uh, working on some of, some of the issues on Prop 64 implementation as well. Um, any other there was a question on the live stream that asked, how does it affect children on probation? Great. So children on probation, uh, 
for I, what I can tell you is that child, uh, people who are 17 and under uh, before Prop 64, if they have a marijuana offense, um, that will ought to be automatically be expunged as soon as they turn 18. But let's say uh, there was a youth who turned 18 before Prop 64 passed there and they committed their offense while they were a juvenile. They're still going to have that on their record. But we suggest that they go to the juvenile court uh, and juvenile public defenders to seek uh, resentencing or reclassification help. But that is possible. Um, and there's forms already that exist for that as well. Um, any other questions? OK, great. Um, so what did we learn from Prop 47 about this process? Uh, well, under 64, we did not want to reinvent the wheel. There was already uh, coalitions that have been built under Prop 47 that are doing the reclassification work under Prop 47. And we're hoping uh, to implement that and, and uh, incorporate that into the existing machines that already are operating. In LA County, the county has taken some steps forward to really uh, invest in implementing Prop 47. So we're hoping that instead of having to fund, you know, implementation of Prop 64, we can literally just add these offenses into those mechanisms that already exist. Um, what we do know is, is that even though these coalitions exist under Prop 47, there's still a lot of, in, like, silos. I know that Northern California and, and Southern California are often uh, kind of in a silo, especially around this, and I think one thing that we're hoping is to connect uh, the coalitions that exist already and even on a higher level. Uh, because it's not just about Prop 47, it's not just about Prop 64, but there's a variety of other expungement uh, resources available, and we want to be able to help just more more people, uh, especially uh, around immigration and drug policy and a lot of these offenses, I mean, a lot of these uh, reforms. So we're hoping to build on what's already been built for Prop 47. Um, so radical drug policy reform. I had a question on how to talk about um, how communities and community organizers can help develop more radical reform. Um, what I can tell you is that what we've learned under Prop 47, like California has been on an like experimental level, right? Doing things that other states across the nation have not even done or even are close to implementing. Um, and we've learned a lot. In the first two years of Prop 47 implementation, we saw that th the entire state there was only a 10% decrease in the number of people that entered the criminal justice system. That's 22,000 less people going into the criminal justice system. That's a lot of people. But a 10% decline is not enough. So when we think about drug policy reform and going a step beyond, we got to acknowledge the things that we've learned. And if under Prop 47, simple drug possession was from, turned from a felony down to a misdemeanor, right? But we know that wasn't enough. So when we think about drug policy and being even more radical, we got to think about including those people that have been impacted and actually helping develop those policies and helping develop those resources and helping create a continuum of care that really supports our communities. Uh, and, and implementing programs that are like based on harm reduction and not just on punishing folks. We know that after 40 years of a criminal justice system, the only thing that we've seen is that generations of our communities have been incarcerated and that's it, nothing else. Um, so when we think about radical drug policy reform, it's about including those people that have been impacted to help us develop the policies, but also know that although we have taken pretty big steps and Prop 47 and Prop 64 are big steps, they're not enough. And we must go even farther because a 10% decline is not enough. So when we talk about really decriminalizing drugs, it's really about decriminalizing drugs and substance use because even now with reducing the penalties from a felony down to a misdemeanor, um, although that might seem like, well, yeah, a felony is way harsher. In the state of California, there's 4,800 barriers that exist to someone with a criminal record, even a misdemeanor offense. And you can still go to jail up to 364 days and be on probation for three years. So although Prop 47 is amazing, and I know, and Prop 64 is not perfect either, let me tell you, I wish some of these uh, criminal justice provision would go even farther, but it's a step in the right direction. Um, we just gotta work harder and in including those uh, that really know how the system works on the inside and really have an idea of, of what our community can look like because criminalization doesn't make our community safer. Uh, the war on drugs hasn't reduced the availability of drugs within our communities and it hasn't um, invested into our communities. Uh, so that's what I, I think about that, but I, I hope if you have any questions, uh, please, please feel free to ask. All right, we're good. <laughs> gonna gonna do, yeah. Gonna... Do to go? Yeah, we'll switch. Okay. Yeah. 
Hi everybody, I'm Cindy Tyler. I don't know if I can speak as loud as she is speaking, but I'm gonna try, okay? So just let me know. <laughs> um, I wanted to speak about Prop 64 from um, my standpoint as an immigration attorney, uh, because it's legal for adults to use marijuana in California, but it's not legal for all adults in California to use marijuana because uh, non-citizens are subject to federal law and that remains unchanged, and it's still a federal offense to use marijuana. Um, so what it did, there's a lot of positive outcomes that came from Prop 64, but you know, still some things to pay attention to in terms of certain people having severe consequences if they use marijuana. Um, so let's see. I wanted to talk just about the law as it was and how it affected people before. Um, and then, you know, Eunice has talked a lot about uh, what happens, what was Prop 64, what did it do, I have some of that as well, but it's more from the standpoint of uh, the immigration context, um, and just generally the implications of drug convictions in immigration, and what post-conviction relief is available for non-immigrants, because it's a little bit different as federal immigration authorities don't always recognize um, like an expungement. Um, and then the most important sort of thing that I see as a flag is like an admission of marijuana use. Um, you can have no conviction at all whatsoever, no record or anything, but if immigration officials find out that you've used marijuana, suddenly you can be treated like you've been convicted of marijuana use, and that can be really bad for you. So. Um, the reason this is important from the criminal context is as well is that the Supreme Court has held that um, criminal defense attorneys have the right or, or they have to advise immigrants of the consequences of their pleas in criminal court on, and their effects on their immigration proceedings. So if you plead guilty <laughs> to something that's like an admission and that can be um, bad for you in immigration, whereas if you said not guilty, then maybe it's a little bit better for you. Um, so I have the same statistics that you have. Um, there were over 200,000 people deported for a drug offense and 38% um, of those cases were drugs for personal use and we've got an increase uh, from 2007 to 2012, a 43% for uh, drug possession. Um, so let's see. What we have is basically all non-citizens are not even treated the same in um, their immigration proceedings. So a marijuana conviction can affect different immigrants differently. Um, if you're a local permanent resident or a refugee, um, maybe you have a student visa, um, what applies to you is deportability. So you have stronger protections, but you can still be arrested, detained, and deported. Um, the next category is like inadmissible. If you're trying to enter the country and you say you're on a visitor visa, you have to be admitted to the country, which means that an, uh, like an immigration officer has to inspect you and find that you don't have any reason for them not to let you in. Um, a drug conviction is basically a reason that they won't let you in. Um, and you can also be fighting for your admission in immigration court and trying to receive uh, that paperwork. You could also get, um, in certain situations, the, the term aggravated felon could be applied to you in certain situations, and that doesn't, ha it doesn't have to be a felony, it could be a misdemeanor, but it's like an immigration term of art that defines whether it is. So, for instance, selling drugs would be an aggravated felony. Um, and this is like more on that, just a permanent resident. If you are a permanent resident, say you've been here however many years and you have a single <coughs> offense involving a possession for their own use of 30 grams or less, maybe you can have that waived and you'll be fine. But as soon as you have a second simple possession or you transport, give away a small amount or offer to sell um, or sell those, um, drugs, then you can be deported. Um, and those, that also applies to refugees and other others. Um, the conduct that goes to being an aggravated felony is the second simple possession. 
uh, cultivation, sale, transportation, giving away more than 30 grams offered to sell. That is, so in the Ninth Circuit, that's not held to be an aggravated felony, just outside. Um, but so Prop 64 just legalized a lot of that going forward, fortunately. But the other thing that the federal government has done is that in, say you, you know you've got a medical marijuana card, the government can try to say that you're a drug addict or drug abuser, and they, that is another ground of deportability that they can use against you. Um, so you just have to really watch out for drug crimes in the immigration context. Um, these are just other things that have happened. Um, you can be detained by immigration authorities. You can lose your green card or your permanent resident <coughs> status. You can lose the ability to apply for permanent resident status or other lawful status. And then you could be just deported and then your family is all separated for however many years until maybe you qualify for a waiver. So. The good news is that Proposition 64 decriminalized a lot of the things. And so federal law tries to look at the state's laws to try to like level the playing field. It's a little bit strange and it must be done on a case by case basis. I don't go into all the details here just because of that. It depends, you know, what status did you have? What crime is it? What state is it in? And we've yet to see a lot of what will happen uh, with Prop 64 as I'll talk a little bit about later. But yeah, so it's no longer a crime if you're over 21 to possess marijuana up to 28.5 grams or eight grams of concentrated cannabis. You can now grow up to six plants and it's not a crime. So you wouldn't receive, you wouldn't go to court and you wouldn't receive a conviction for doing those things. Uh, it's a little bit more complicated for persons 18 through 20 because uh, that is still an infraction and we'll talk about in just a minute, but that's going to be complicated to determine as well. Um, and the good news is if you have a prior conviction, you can try to reduce it. You can try to reduce it to an infraction or just to have no conviction at all, or you can seal your record. And, you know, DUIs remained unchanged, as does like um, marijuana use at school or having more than 28.5 grams, that remains the same too, for California. Um, these are some of the ways that Prop 64 is helpful. You know, it's no longer a crime, so you won't be charged and you won't lose your lawful status or being a, uh, barred for applying for status in the future. Um, it's an infraction for 18 to 20 years old, and you won't be barred from applying from lo for lawful status. Um, and you can get post-conviction relief, which can help reduce um, the number of people subject to deportation and it creates opportunities for those who are previously ineligible, now they might be able to apply for things that they wouldn't be able to apply for before. So this is the hard part too. There is no standard or legal precedent exactly for when an infraction is a conviction. The only rule that we have is whether it, the standard requires a jury trial for instance or jail time or finding of guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. Those are kind of constitutional protections that go into determining whether it's an, a conviction or also whether it can be used as a, an add-on for a future sentence to um, enhance the sentence and the subsequent prosecution. Um, and the code um, for possession of less than 30 grams of marijuana in the past has been used as a conviction. So in these times, we don't have an exact answer because it's only been just a couple of months. Uh, but it could, uh, it could turn out to be bad for those who are 18 to 20 if they get an infraction and can't um, get post-conviction relief afterwards. Um, so she talked a lot about post-conviction relief and what you need to do in the steps, which is really good because we the recommendation for immigration attorneys is to do both. If you can reduce the conviction, do that. If you can eliminate it, do that too. Uh, because your advocates are going to have to argue that a reduced conviction doesn't amount to a conviction for immigration purposes and so can't be used. And then if it's eliminated, you also argue the same, that it ceases to be a conviction. Uh, one of the problems is that it 
the federal immigration authorities don't always honor post-conviction relief. And so, say you vacated on, um, you know, they completed their probation and so it's vacated. Well, that might not be enough for immigration because it isn't legal in validity. Um, for whatever reason, that's not enough. Um, and so it needs to be a substantial, substantive defect in criminal proceedings that caused the reduction. So they will do a uh, legal error. They will honor, usually honor that kind of post-conviction relief, but not things such as completing probation. Another thing you could argue is that they didn't understand or weren't advised of the consequences of this plea um, when they were in their criminal proceedings. So uh, that's another thing that you can argue, but again, it's making these arguments. They don't always um, go through. All the immigration authorities don't uh, respect them. Depends on where you are, and we don't really know. Um, so another thing is that I think after two years, Prop 64, um, one of the things you can do is you can have the record destroyed. Um, and so another thing you can do is wait, and then if the immigration authorities cannot prove that you have this conviction, um, then you can win on that and have the uh, post-conviction relief apply to you. Um, and failing all of that, there are other types of post-conviction relief that already exist. Something else went into effect and codified in Penal Code 1473.7. Um, it's post-conviction relief for those who did not understand the adverse consequences of a guilty plea in their criminal conviction. Uh, so that's another way to sort of argue post-conviction relief for people who are in deporta deportation proceedings as a result of a marijuana conviction. Uh, the other ones sound a little more complicated. You can complete a California deferred entry of judgment, have those charges dismissed, and then withdraw the guilty plea. Um, and then we have the Ninth Circuit, and if it's a first convict, of, of possession um, if it occurred before July uh, 13th 2011 then uh, you can get post conviction relief on that the other positive thing that Prop 64 <coughs> does although um, it's a little bit an influx right now it may help you qualify for DACA or TPS I don't think it's recommended to apply for DACA right now, although the orders that Obama issued, ha I mean, Trump, oh, the orders that Trump has have issued so far, um, they don't mention DACA. But um, there's no guarantee that anyone who has DACA is safe because the government has their information. Um, and there's, you know, it's really scary to think about applying for DACA right now if you're undocumented and hiding under the radar. So, but it may help your eligibility for DACA should it continue. Uh, TPS is a little bit different in that way, but um, it's still a temporary program for people who say um, your country had flooding or some other severe weather condition, maybe war, then um, the federal government has sometimes established temporary protected status for certain, uh, for those countries, for people who are already here. Um, but it's still a temporary program that might not be renewed and then you could be sent back to your country if it's not renewed. So I'm not sure that I would recommend applying for that right now. Um, we'll see how things play out though. Um, but as it decriminalizes, as Prop 64 decriminalizes the conduct, um, then these programs remain available. Okay, are there any questions so far? We're kind of going on and on. Okay. I just want to highlight one thing that you said, just so it doesn't get lost. Uh, one of our allies and partners, the Immigration Legal Resource Center, we had a call with them a couple weeks ago, and they advised us um, something very interesting that everybody should share as much as possible. And it's for people who are immigrants, uh, never ever admit to marijuana use or marijuana possession. If you have that on your social media, delete it. If anybody asks you, say no, I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, because uh, like Cindy mentioned, even if you have not been convicted of marijuana offense, just your admission of possession or usage can put you on that list of admissibility. So just be aware of that, let people know, uh, don't say yes, oh, that's very important. That's where I'm going next. <laughs> we talk about it again, no, it's good. 
um, but it creates, it's a problem, right? So you are a lawful permanent resident, you applied for your naturalization, all the paperwork checks out, you don't have to answer on the naturalization paperwork anything about marijuana necessarily. You go to your interview though, the officer asks, have you ever, commi have you ever committed a crime for which you were not arrested? Or have you ever used drugs? If you say yes, you know, you could put yourself in removal proceedings. If you say no, you could, and, and somebody finds out through your social media, through a friend, through anybody, then you could be charged with misrepresentation as well, which is fraud, which is all the, another really big deal. And if you're in front of your attorney and your attorney happens to know that you've used marijuana, then your attorney has a duty of candor to the immigration authorities as well, and that creates another ethical problem for your attorney. So basically, don't tell anybody. Keep it off social media. It's, the, it's advised just not to use it, if possible, just to avoid, avoid that sort of circumstance. Um, but yeah, uh, another example in Colorado where it's also legal to use marijuana, somebody was put into removal proceedings because officials found a photo of her at a dispensary on her cell phone. Um, these pictures are like everywhere, it's really easy to just take them. Um, and let's see, what else do we say about that? Uh, the best way thing to do if you're put in this situation is to decline to answer. Uh, because then you've not lied and you've not kind of created a problem. It could still be a problem if you decline to answer that, right? Um, but you have a better chance because you haven't made an omission. Um, so, and then we have, oh, yes? Sorry, I'm a little confused with like, I thought attorney-client privilege meant that you It puts your attorney in a difficult position because your attorney also has the duty to be truthful in whatever proceeding. So if it's court, if it's whatever, they, they have to do their best to make sure everything that goes out is true. And they can't help you lie exactly as, as it would be seen by immigration authorities. Yes? It's on a case-by-case -case basis. So if you have Prop 64 and you get the post-conviction relief, that could be very useful to you. Um, because if it is, if the post-conviction relief is granted and the judges or the immigration authorities find everything is okay, um, and all the other equities balance out, then maybe it's fine. Um, I would say this administration is going to make everything really difficult for us. Um, and so it's something to visit an immigration attorney about before doing anything with immigration. Yes, 10 minutes, okay, cool. Anybody else? Yes. Um, yeah, I'm just trying to process all of this because um, I do a lot of grand jury criminal records work, but I'm trying to better understand immigration consequences in part because it seems like no one really does it or not enough people. So even telling people to talk to an immigration attorney seems like sometimes dead end advice when there's not a lot of immigration attorneys who will do it for free, who know criminal record stuff, who also have cultural competency about what people are experiencing and trauma in their neighborhoods and all that stuff. So it's kind of, I, I find it really intimidating and I would love like strategies, places to go to talk in groups. Like I know there's free SF in San Francisco, so I re recently got on that listserv where people are talking about the immigration consequences and I'm wondering, like our organization wants to put out helpful information, know your rights information, but it seems really hard to do carefully um, and also getting people to the right legal help and if it even exists. So I'm struggling to understand all of that and I don't know if you have suggestions or strategies or 
should we just say go to my prop 64 website it's going to tell you don't say this stuff and it's already in plain language and it's translated i don't know is there suggestions around that if it's just around marijuana and prop or is it well, just in general immigration and criminal records stuff well anything where people because we're getting like 30 calls a day now about immigration and criminal record stuff and it's not just california it's texas it's illinois it's florida mm -hmm. so um just having a place to really give good information and know your right stuff and who are the attorneys that people can even go to who can advise them properly is it the pd is it i don't know and are they going to get put on the stand like i don't know it just sounds really difficult well suggestions about I think also it depends on the region. I know that in Southern California, we do have pockets of like attorneys that work with us, but also the Immigrant Legal Resource Center, they're, they're based in the Bay Area and they have a lot of this information yeah. and are already plugged into those existing resources. Yeah. Um, so, so I would- We've been working with Rose Khan on the fact sheet. Yeah. And I said, is there anyone else we should be talking to to look at it? And she's like, there's no one else. She's the one. Yeah. yeah. And that, then when I'm telling people on the fact sheet, go talk to an immigration attorney. You know, I can't put Rose's cell. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm like, <laughs> that's and that's true one thing though that now that there's a bill through the pipeline and the legislator to allocate funding for public defenders right. so that they can become knowledgeable in the immigration yeah. process and consequences yeah. so I know that's in the pipeline yeah okay. so that, that would be a great uh, opportunity to write a letter of support okay yeah. sorry if I'm not helpful to the conversation but it's just definitely something we've been struggling with no yeah. it's really important there are I think very few attorneys that do criminal immigration or criminalization of a growing population are because of its like increase in possibilities mm -hmm. for people with uh, drug offenses and just um, decriminalization. Now there's a lot more, um, I mean, people can do a lot more things with it. And also the thing I meant to say is that the government has made it harder over time since like the 80s and 90s to do that kind of work. Um, but I think, yeah, ILRC is a great place to start. They have a wonderful practice advisory on this topic. Um, and just, I don't know, I don't want to throw specific names out there right now. But yeah. That bill is Assembly Bill 3. That, so if anybody wants to write a letter, that's a good one. Is that the public defender bill? Yeah, okay. AB3, Assembly Bill 3. Um, and there's one other thing I thought to mention about uh, another discussion, the juvenile records. AB 899 last year passed, I think it's codified as Welfare and Institutions Code <coughs> 831, but it keeps juvenile records confidential from immigra the immigration authorities without a uh, California court order. So that's a useful tool, although the immigration authorities will often say, oh, well, why don't you go get the... <laughs> court order to get these papers for us, but um, it's another step that uh, we can use to try to get through. I have a question. Um, I know that the first time uh, sales offenders are given misdemeanors now, but what are the situations in which, uh, but if it's your second time, it's still charged as a felony from my understanding. Can you talk about some of the circumstances where people will still be charged as if it's uh, when it's not a misdemeanor? I don't actually know all the answer to that question off the top of my head. I apologize. So there we'll is. Talk about it later. Um, if you know. Yeah, for, for non not around immigration, but the actual, like, the sentencing on 64. So we put penalty charts. Uh, one of them is adult, and then one of them is the juvenile. Uh, but for sales, it does start off as your French offense is a misdemeanor, right. um, and then after that, it becomes a wobbler. Uh, so uh, again, the political climate, we couldn't you know, put everything that we wanted in this bill. This is one of those things we didn't like, um, which is kind of like adding more time or add, upping the offense uh, once a person commits uh, like the offense a second time or a third time. Um, I think it's a tiered level, but uh, for some of the offenses under 64, it does exist that way. Um, one thing under 64, though, is that the legislator can't up the punishment for the offenses. So this is the this is the punishment that currently exists in the penalties. Moving forward, we will probably be able to like uh, you know chip away at that even further. But this is this is what we were able to do uh, with the political climate that existed and with the other people that were kind of uh, leading this because we didn't have 100% a say in it. Yeah. yeah. 
And the Euler C charts, whoa, are on the screen. Those are really useful determining, determining any penalties in immigration. Um, and that is the title of the ILRC report on this topic. Great. Well, thank you so much for, for listening to us. We know it could be pretty, pretty intense information, but we hope that you can share it. Um, and please uh, send us an email if you have any questions. Yeah. Thank you.